Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and today we're talking about how to keep your garden growing in tip-top condition. So let's dig in. One of the things that many organic gardeners seem to forget is you know, the amount of effort that you put into your garden, the better your vegetables are going to taste. So there is an element of watering, feeding, weeding and protecting plants and providing support that we have to do in our garden. And the reward for that care and attention is, you know, really delicious homegrown produce. Now, um, watering, I'm going to talk about first because veggies and fruits and stuff need water. Okay. There's, there's no, um, ways around that, whether, um, you get a, a lot of rainfall, um, or not as the case may be, um, where I live anyway, um, you have to provide water to your vegetable garden. Now you can grow things that are more drought tolerant so they can cope with that stress from no water a little bit better, but ultimately you need to be watering your garden and you want to be watering your garden deeply so you know that's where you're um watering until you can kind of see a puddle and then stopping the watering let that seep down and then watering again until you see a puddle forming on that ground and the reason why we're we're stopping as we're watering is because you want to allow that water to seep down into that soil um, and you don't just want it to evaporate up at the top you want it to have a chance to work through the soil and to where those roots are needed so at least once a week um, you might need to be watering a lot more frequently so where I live I'm having to water um, at least every other day And some plants I'm having to water by hand every day. Um, So it's just understanding your garden and your soil. And of course, having a soil that's um, rich in lots of organic matter. And by organic matter, we mean well-rotted compost, well-rotted manure, um, those, those kind of things that are worked in. It helps to conserve water in the soil. So this is really important if you've got a sandy soil like I do. Um, you can help enrich that soil by digging in organic matter. Um, you can grow green manures and then turn them under. Um, or you can use a continuous mulching method. So continuous mulching is where you're covering that soil Um all the time basically so things like uh, straw is really good um, other people use things like um, farmyard manure compost um, even cut grass so if you don't treat your lawn with any pesticides or herbicides and you don't have a, a lot of uh, puppies pooping all over it for example um, then you can um, you know, mow mow the lawn and collect those grass clippings and then spread them uh, onto your soil. Um, obviously, if you've got a lawn that's treated or um, you've got pets that are using it as a bathroom, um, don't put that near your, your vegetable garden because um, we don't want to bring in some of those problems into your veggies. But when you're watering, um, definitely give those plants a thorough soaking and allow that water to penetrate deeply, okay? A light watering is just going to encourage surface roots that are going to be easily damaged by prolonged droughts. And, you know, if you're in those kind of conditions where it's hot and dry, then that's going to start your plant getting stressed and it's going to start producing flowers and ultimately seed. Now, for some plants that might be good, but for a lot of others, like leafy greens that's not a good thing that we want i mean nobody wants a cabbage to start flowering early we want to be able to actually harvest a cabbage right so mulching has got a lot of benefits to it and you know not just with um protecting from soil loss but mulching is also going to help protect those shallow roots that are formed and that's going to help um the plant from not stressing out so much um But also mulches provide a source of food. So, you know, if you've got heavy feeding plants like pumpkins and squashes and zucchini, stuff like that, um, you know, uh, 
an extra feeding is super helpful okay and that's that's one of the things that a lot of organic gardeners forget is to keep feeding their garden even though we're working in a lot of stuff to the soil you know especially if you're a new garden and you've got a new gardener and you've got a new garden and you're trying to help things get established then definitely keep feeding your plants you know look at them often you know are the leaves turning yellow? Do they look a little bit sad and wilty? Or are they green and vibrant and lush? If they're green and vibrant and lush, then you might not need to to feed them. But if they're looking like, um, you know, they need a little bit of help, then a little, um, you know, tonic for them um, is, is a good idea. And you can get a, you know, commercial, off-the-shelf, unrealisted um, organic fertilizers. And, you know, I've used those too. And they're great some of them um i i love the down to earth ones i use them um a lot in my garden because i have sandy soil um i do need to keep on top of the nutrient levels because things get washed away very quickly um and I'll link up to those um, in my gardening kit uh, in the show notes if you're interested to see which ones I use. Um, but, you know, you can also make your own as well. And comfrey tea is a really popular one. So if you're growing comfrey plants, when you chop it all back, you can just basically put it all into a bucket of water and let that steep for a couple of weeks it it stinks it really stinks there's no two ways about it um but it's really good for your plants and you can dilute about a cup into a three gallon watering can and use that um to water your garden and plants with um another way that people make comfrey fertilizer is to chop the comfrey um put all the leaves into a bucket with some holes in and then put a weight on top to start crushing them and then put another container underneath the bucket or prop that bucket up onto some breeze blocks or cinder blocks um and then put a container underneath and uh, as that concentrated liquid drips down into the container they can collect that and then that's what they then dilute down to use um, as a feed um, either way you know works it's just down to your personal preference and um, some other like homemade fertilizers people can make are ones with strawberry leaves um ones with grass clippings um you can even do one where you pull all the weeds and just dump them into um some non-chlorinated water and just let them break down uh it can take a couple of weeks it can take a couple of months um but eventually those things will those weeds will all break down and uh, release those nutrients that they pulled up from the soil um i I like to call that one gardener's revenge and that that one's uh, always worked very well although my husband has a uh, really um unelegant name for that particular uh (laughs) garden fertilizer Um, i'm probably not going to repeat it on here because um, i try to be family friendly (laughs) um Worm tea is also a good one to to um, use and you can do that by putting some worm castings in some non-chlorinated water um, and then let that um, sort of stew for a couple of days. Some people add um, some sugar to it or non uh sulfur containing molasses um, and uh, that helps the bacteria get started and then they can um, you know whip it up or stir it up very vigorously to enter into some oxygen um, and help that bacteria get established and then they'll use that to water the garden because those bacteria microorganisms that are in these um natural fertilizers are going to help your garden because they're going to help those plants take up those nutrients as they get established so um, you can also use these uh, mycorrhizal fungi and add those periodically and that's one of the things that people who grow these giant vegetables do um they're using a lot of these um compost teas or you know like um plant teas that they're producing and they're using these mycorrhizal fungi um to help their garden and their plant get established 
Now, of course, the question is, how often do you apply these liquid feeds? Well, every week or every two weeks is usually typical, especially if these are ones that you're making yourself rather than using commercial preparations. Um, you know, every week or every other week is just fine. And many plants are given their main feed annually. Um, this is especially true if you are... Um, you know, using a lot of perennials in the garden, you know, when you're adding in compost and stuff. But another way that you can add your nutrients or feeding to the garden is by side dressing. Now, um, I recently posted a video um, about this up in the Grey Roan Food Academy um, on the uh, private Facebook page where I was uh, doing some quick tips for tomato growing and I was explaining what side dressing was because one of the um, uh, students in the Grey Own Food Academy asked me what it was and really it's just a fancy term to um, apply compost or fertilizer to a plant and it's called side dressing because you're adding it from the side of the plant usually so you're just kind of sprinkling a handful around the base of the plant or if you're putting compost or mulch down then you're putting it all around the base of the plant and that's what side dressing is so if you've got um, an issue where you're starting to really look at your garden and get in there and weed and see what's going on if you're starting to see a lot of these um, surface roots appearing then it is a really good idea to side dress with some more compost and some more mulch and kind of make a mound around um, the base of your plant there because that's going to help protect those roots um, more often than not what's happening um, if you're starting to see those roots is um, you've got shallow watering that's happening it's not getting in there deep enough um, for those plants to really go down and search for that water. Um, it also could be because the topsoil is being eroded away by your watering. So it might be that your um, hose that you're using is a little bit too aggressive. Um, if you've got like one of those attachments that turn into a jet of water, um, then that's going to be too much. You're kind of thinking shower head. A shower head is usually um, the best way to be watering your plants if you're going to be using a hose and of course you know overhead um, sprinklers too can actually wash away some of that uh, topsoil too so get in there with some really good uh, good quality compost you can get the stuff bagged from the store that's totally okay there's no shame in that um, or you can get it from your city dump if they offer that service as well I've just had to go buy some directly from a big box store because that's all that was open during um you know the pandemic and everything that we're dealing with right now so that's that's okay too now if you've got a lot of fruit trees or bushes and those kind of things then you know usually if you're going to be feeding those plants you feed them in spring and it's usually applied in the form of a slow release organic fertilizer or it is a very very good spreading of well-rotted manure or well-rotted uh, compost around the base now not up close to the trunk you you want to be kind of putting your fertilizers and stuff um, around the drip line of those plants because that's where the roots are so the drip line is the where the um, branches and the leaves extend to and then directly below that is usually where you find those feeder roots all right next up is weeding and you know my my garden um sometimes gets weeded a lot and sometimes does not get weeded a lot and um you will find that if you don't weed your garden uh very often you end up with a much bigger job on your hands um because you're trying to battle these more established plants now we a weed is simply a plant that is in you know a place where you don't want it and weeds are going to be taking up some of those nutrients that you are trying to put down for your garden to grow 
And, um, you know, getting in there and weeding by hand is very labor intensive. It's good exercise, though, um, but it does take time. But if you're weeding by hand, it is um, one of the, the better ways to get those weeds out because you're right there and you can see the roots and you're able to, you know, pull those things up. Now, I got a lot of uh, raised beds and weeding by hand is really the only way that I can do that. In the test garden bed though it's much easier for me to hoe around everything um, and I, I love um, using the hoe to do that. Um, it's one of my favorite garden tools for a main like in garden type of garden. Um, obviously you can't use those in a tall raised bed scenario um, but a hoe makes very quick and light work of doing um, you know these weeding activities because it just slices off the top of um, the plant from the roots thereby killing it so it's really really good to do that but we want to be getting rid of those weeds because they do compete with your plants for that light the space the water and one of the other things um, that we don't necessarily talk about why we want to weed is a lot of weeds can harbor pests and diseases that can then spread into our garden so by making sure that we're keeping weeds well away from our garden we're removing some of those host plants that you know those pests really like to hang out on and same for diseases like in my garden for example i will always see powdery mildew on uh, the bindweed and when I see powdery mildew on the bindweed I know that that stuff is then going to be spreading to my squashes and everything else that I've got growing in the garden peas beans squashes they're the most um, susceptible here in my garden but I try to be very diligent at removing the bindweed because that is the first thing to get it in the garden so try and keep areas weed free um, and you know even areas that have got like lots of mulch on them or you've got very close um, plantings to try and shade things out they do need regular checks because you will see that you've got weeds kind of getting established under the the canopy there and just um, you know pull them out as you see them and it could be as simple as just challenging yourself to do, you know, one small garden bed a day if you've got raised beds or, you know, maybe you garden and, you know, weed a row. Um, I've actually found that it's really therapeutic to do so. And because the temperatures are getting a little bit hot where I am, I'm kind of limited to the time that I'm getting out there and gardening. So I might be getting out there before seven in the morning um, on a weekend <laughs> to to do some of these things. Um, or I will be going out and doing gardening like after three o'clock in the afternoon when the sun's kind of passing over and my garden is starting to get into the shade a little bit because um, I'm very fair um, in terms of um, my com complexion so I burn very quickly um, even with factor 50 and factor 60 sun hat and everything else on so I try to fit in some of my gardening activities around um, not just my work schedule but also um, the schedule of you know how hot it is going to be out there and like I said little and often is you know really better to be doing it that way rather than weeding irregularly um, just because you're going to be finding it a lot easier to keep on top of everything and you know one of the best things that you can do is you know do some weeding and then apply some mulch and that's going to um, help cover the soil and reduce the amount of weeds that you've got coming back next up I want to talk a little bit about plant protection so I talked a little bit about um, protecting from pests and diseases a minute ago um, but um, there's you know so, so many different pests and diseases in the garden and they vary so much depending on where you live and over time you're going to know which specific problems your garden is prone to okay keep a garden journal I can't stress that enough a garden journal is so helpful um, because you're going to be keeping a note of you know the things that are going to be affecting your crop each season um, what control measures you used how often did you feed what variety grew well what didn't all these things and um, if this is something that you would find really interesting like what sort of things you should be 
um, recording in your garden journal, then please let me know over in the Facebook group. And I am quite happy to bust out my garden journal and um, tell you what I write in there. Um, but, you know, in time, you're going to have a record of, you know, how often you get these kind of past things, what time of year they typically arise and how you manage them. And it's really important that if you know these things ahead of time, then you can start to prepare for them. Um, but also, you know, even if you're a new gardener, like getting out there, out there into your garden on a regular basis and really checking what's going on in the garden, um, that's going to help you and make those notes, you know, oh, I'm starting to see yellowing leaves on this squash or I notice these grey splotches on this plant or, you know, this this leaf uh, on my Swiss chard had a really weird, like, you know, winding river pattern on it. Um, you know, these kind of things are flags of various pests and diseases and um you know you could start to you know research those find out what's going on um and then you can start to take measures to um protect your plants so maybe you need to um put some organic slug pellets down maybe you need to set some beer traps maybe you need to use some uh diatomaceous earth like there's lots of things that we can do to reduce the pests in our garden. There's also lots of things we can do to encourage beneficial uh, bugs into the garden to help, um, you know, monitor and um, the uh, the pest burden, um, which is the, the level of bugs that you get. So you could look at maybe growing things like nasturtiums um, or French marigolds poached eggplants, um, different herbs are really good at attracting beneficial insects. So things like dill and fennel um, are really well loved by lots of different insects and those will help to bring in things that are going to help uh, alleviate some of the pest problems. If maybe if you've got a lot of aphids that you've noticed or white fly underneath um, the leaves of your cabbage plants or brassicas for example you know maybe you want to be using a soapy water spray to knock those off or perhaps you just want to introduce more ladybugs ladybirds um, and lace wings into the garden so you know really using some um good record keeping is going to be really helpful to you and you know if you're having like a a, a lot of um problems that you're seeing with a certain pest over the the years then maybe you could start to look at protecting your plant in a different way so maybe building a cage to prevent those pests from getting in and I say that because that's a very common way to protect carrots in England. People grow them in like a mesh cage to prevent the carrot fly from getting in there and um, laying the eggs and producing the maggots that are boring through. And people grow their carrots next to onions because the onion scent um, masks the smell of the carrots and the carrot scent masks um you know, or helps to deter the onion fly on the other side. So um, there are different measures that you can do to benefit many different plants. So um, that's called companion planting. And there's a lot of great resources that are out there for it. Um, one of my favorite is Tomatoes Love Carrots. And that's a great book that's got a, a lot of different um, companion planting um, schemes in there. So I will hook that up in uh, my gardening kit uh, in the show notes. And finally, one of the things that I want to talk about today is providing um, support. Um, and that's, you know, just really making sure that plants have what they need in terms of growing. So if you're growing pole beans, um, you know, the key might be in the name there. Um, <laughs> or they're also known as climbing beans in the UK. Um, so they, they need to have support to grow 
up and over okay and this support needs to begin at an early age because trying to wind in a a plant that's got a lot of growth on it can be very difficult same with tomatoes you know a lot of people um like to use tomato cages or train their tomatoes on a on a line that's what we've done this year in the greenhouse Um, But the earlier that you do it, uh, the easier time you're going to have because there's nothing worse than trying to wind established plants around a string and hope that you don't break off branches that are laden with fruit. Okay, Um, There's a couple of good reasons why we want to grow these things upright and that's because it's going to free up space in your garden bed because the plant's going to be going up rather than out and along the bed. Um, It also means that you can plant more in that space, which is great um, because you can put things closer together. Not too close, but you can definitely put more things in there. And even plants like zucchini can be trained up a trellis and uh, that's going to help them get more light as well. It can also help uh, pollinators find flowers for things, Um, and it also looks pretty as well. Um, But I really like the idea that you can plant more in the space because you're able to um, really open up that garden bed. I also um, grow over trellises things like um, squashes, pumpkins and um, I will tell you right now that one of the best ways to support pumpkins and melons and stuff like that that is growing uh, ladies old bras are amazing for holding these plants okay they're they are really good because you can um, obviously put the the plant into um, you know the normal use of the bra but you could also just use it to kind of set on one side and then the strap you can just hook onto the trellis because I I have cattle panel trellising so it's easy for me to kind of hook things over but because the bands are really really strong on them if you've got you know big melons and big squashes growing through the trellis no pun intended there um but they're really good to support those things and they work really well it does look a little bit odd in the garden I will give you that the first time my husband saw it he was kind of bemused for the longest time um but then you know my girlfriends who all garden they get it and people I've seen people doing it all over the place now so um yeah definitely um think outside of the box for plant support Um, But it's a really good idea if you're growing these bigger squashes or melons and things over a trellis, you have to provide support for them because the weight of the fruit growing is it's going to snap that vine and we don't want that. We want to keep that plant growing. We want to keep those fruits getting the nutrients that they need until they're ready for harvest. And finally, finally, I'm going to give you a bonus one here and that's about harvesting and you know, it's really tempting um, to pick out all the good specimens and leave the rest. But, you know, you need to um, pick even the bad ones and get those out of the way of the garden. Like if you've got things that, you know, are showing signs of disease, you really want to be removing those and getting them out of the garden. But also, you know, picking the right things when it comes to harvest time, you know you want to be picking your plants at the peak of their um you know growth when they're ready um because then they're going to be full of those you know nutrients and vitamins and stuff like that that your body needs and they're going to taste so much better the other thing of course is letting um some plants go to seed and saving the seed for you to grow um the following year and this is especially true if you're growing um heirloom varieties um or land race varieties i i definitely definitely encourage you know people to at least leave um a plant in the row that they're growing or a plant in the box that they're growing just let it go to seed and save those seeds and try and grow again and the reason why i say this is because there's a variety of tomato that i've been growing for like the last four years and each year i've i've saved seed from it and grown it again And I've now got tomatoes that are like the size of my hand. They are massive. They're not a beefsteak variety. It's a canning variety. And I've just been very diligent in making sure that I save seed 
each each year from the garden and each year I grow again with these seeds I'm seeing better and better results from the garden and you know I, I mean, I, I love kind of experimenting with plant breeding anyway. And I did a whole episode about land race gardening, which you should really, really check out um, if you're interested in that. But if you're growing heirlooms and not hybrid varieties, because you won't be able to, I mean, you can save the seed from the hybrid variety, but when you grow it out again, it's not going to be um, similar to what you grew the year before. Um, you know, definitely save that seed and start to really own where your food is coming from, not just from the garden, but from the seed supply as well. Anyway, I hope you guys are all doing well and that you enjoyed listening to this episode. Stay safe out there and I hope that your garden grows beautifully. Until next time, I'll see you next week.